Welcome to Adeptus On Air, the show where we examine how individuals and companies make decisions that drive their business and personal success. Each week, we connect with notable professionals who pull back the curtain on the industries that Adeptus has been on the cutting edge of for the last 30 years, including music, sports, and entertainment, as well as new emerging markets. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Adeptus on Air. I am your host, Mike Hoffman, and today I am joined by uh, someone who I can honestly say I have known for probably about 45 years. So as much as I'm excited to talk to him about uh, you know, his profession and what he's doing and some great projects he's working on, I just want to kind of catch up. So welcome uh, one of the owners and founders of Ironbound Films, Daniel Miller. Dan, how you doing, buddy? I'm great. I'm great. It's great to see you, Mike. It's been a long time. Yeah. So uh, for full context, we grew up uh, in uh, North Edison, six houses from each other. Yes. I think I did the math this morning. I think it was six houses. Uh, right. I'm not very good at math, even though I'm an accountant. So I had to, you know, I had to figure that out. And then, uh, you know, spent a lot of time together, you know, both in school and clubs, activities, just hanging out. Uh, a lot of memories of you, I think, actually hanging out with you in your basement. I think. Uh, yes. Yeah. Ping pong was pretty popular. I think even as much as you're you're saying how much time we spent together, Mike, you're still underselling it. I would say that the memories you are so deep in the recesses of my memories of my childhood in like so many different yeah. experiences that it's it's almost overwhelming to see you again. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think the last uh, time I saw you, I think we probably bumped into each other maybe like 10, 15 years ago, in like the in like the mall or something. I think I saw you walking, but I think it was so long ago that if my memory is correct, because I think your kids are a little younger than mine, uh-huh. I think you actually had a carriage with you. That's possible. I remember you had a, a, a girl hanging on your leg. Does that sound familiar? I, I still do. <laughs> yeah. The problem is they're now 22 and 17, and they do tend to hang on my leg sometimes, yes. Right, yes. I have an 18 and a 16-year-old. Yeah, so we're, we're we're pretty close. I got a little bit up on you on the first one, but then we're uh, we're, we're pretty even. So, uh, been back to the old stomping grounds recently, or you know, I was there maybe like a year ago uh, or so. You know, it's very weird to go back. H- have you been back? Mm-hmm. The... Well, my wife is a school principal in Edison, but on the other side of town. So, oh, and that's where I'm she was actually the elementary school that she is the principal is where she went to. So I always okay. joke with her that she was born on the other side of the tracks and I lowered myself to marry her because she was South Edison. <laughs> but uh, I'm in the area every once in a while. I think I drove by the house maybe about two, three years ago. Right, right. Well, what's most remarkable to me about the houses is that like when we grew up, like right, our neighborhood was essentially built in like the mid fifties, mm-hmm. right? All those houses came up in the fifties. And so we grew up in the seventies, eighties in, in Edison and by that time, the houses felt like kind of new, fresh, you know, mm-hmm. now you go back and they're, however we have, our old, however old we are now, plus 40 years, right? So everything yeah. looks a little more dilapidated, dingier, oh, yeah. and also like smaller. I think we've grown a little bit, right? So everything looks We've grown a little bit. And, you know, I don't know where you're living now, but obviously the house I'm in now is just a, it's just a bigger house than what we grew up in. So when I've showed my kids, they're like, that's where you lived? <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, that, that was my room. And I had the small room. My sister had the bigger room, but I had a little room. Right. Yeah. And it I still joke like with my mom now. Back then, right? Oh, it, it felt like it. But like, you know, I could still picture your house. But my house, the, like the three bedroom doors, you know, it was only a three bedroom house. All uh-huh. the doors met in the same point. There was no hallway upstairs. Right. So like you walked out of your room and you were like in your parents' room and in your sister's room. So there was like literally you were on top of each other the entire time. Yeah. Yeah, it was, you know, just a different experience. I mean, now I think part of growing up in that neighborhood has like sort of uh, put inside me the need to get a big house, you know, yeah. in like an old house and like a nice neighborhood. And so I don't know that that sort of that drive didn't exist with our parents necessarily. They were happy in like a commuter town close mm-hmm. to Metro North. i uh, sorry, close to uh, Metro Park. Close, yeah. Thank you. Metro Park. Yeah. Um, you know, and, but a lot of it, too, is like I still drive past like 131A on the parkway, right? And I still think uh, if I got off here, or should I get wait to yeah. 131B where you circle back? And I think know? now actually 131A on the parkway is now like 132. I think they renamed it, which like caused right. all this 
I remember on Facebook when it became 132, people were like, what the hell? My entire identity is based upon 131A. Yeah. It, right, it, right. It, it's crazy. There was a lot of driving, right? We did a lot of driving back in- We did a lot of driving. I know you and I spent a lot of time riding our bikes up to other people's houses. I know where the yes. tennis courts. Uh -huh. uh, we played a lot of late night basketball in my backyard. Yes, you know, I remember- as yes. my parents called it, it was like the Olympics because it was us, the Jewish guys. It was the guy from Korea, the guy from India, okay. the guy from China. You know, it was like, you know, it was it was really like a, uh, you know, an international type game every time. But, yeah, they're, they're great memories. Yes, they are. They are. They, you know, it's so funny now because let's say I will, you know, I live in a community now. I live in uh, Scarsdale. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the Indian, pe there's some Indian people here. It's like where we grew up. You know, mm -hmm. but when I tell them I'm from Edison, they're like, wow. It's like we almost grew up in New Delhi, you know. Oh, it's it, 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 it's funny. It, it's like the homeland. It, you know, it, yeah. it's exactly right. Yeah. And and, and it's, it's still very similar there. there. You know. Yeah. I, I watch clips. Uh, You know, our, our band director, which obviously no one knows by name, obviously, he retired this past year. Oh, like literally did. this okay. year at the age of 70 something. He'd been there 50 years. And I watched some clips of his band right now, and it's really unrecognizable because when we were there, it was a more diverse group. It was, you know, it was Caucasians, it was Asians, it was in, it was everything. And uh -huh. now the population there is really, I think, now ninety percent plus Asian. Is just how the neighborhoods evolved, even more so than it was. We were like the starting point of that transformation. Mm -hmm. And you look at it, and it, it's just so different right now. It, it's really amazing how over time certain areas just you know repopulate. Yeah. Yeah, I you know, uh, Mr. Di Nicola, yes, yeah. was yeah, and he, I no band program at any school that I'm at will ever live up to what that was, you know. Yeah, that was like it was like a team. It was like being coached on a team, you yeah. know. And it was like no one takes it as serious. That guy, like, really, he he was like a cult leader almost, right? Yeah, yeah. And you were such a super talented musician, a lot more so than I was. I was very mediocre, and that was. That was saying a lot, but I remember being before you got into band and I think you started playing the saxophone later on in, in life or say, but you were, I remember just being an awesome piano player. And uh, like, yeah, well, <laughs> that is my... well, maybe you don't think you're awesome compared to me. I, mean, I, I could play Mary had a little lamb kind of thing, but right, you were right. awesome. And then I remember you just picked up a saxophone and like instantaneously because you just had a feel for that kind of stuff. You, you had that artistic kind of mindset. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was kind of my thing back then. Right. You were more of the, uh, the leader, right? You took on a leadership role in band, yeah. right? Yes. That's right. I was up there waving my hands. <laughs> okay. That was one secret I wasn't sure if I could reveal on the, well, on the air. I, I, I'm, my wife doesn't allow me to talk about it, but I don't, I don't think she's going to listen to this. But, you know, wearing the white tuxedo, and I was very skinny, so it did not look good with the white Capizio shoes. With right. the green bow tie and the green cummerbund, it was not a look that was very necessarily appealing to anyone. Including yes, myself. Yes. Yeah, that was yeah. that was a tough part of marching band in general. I think is those <laughs> the look was. I can still yeah. feel that polyester on me, you know, from those uniforms and and, and the hat. But yeah, but right. there were great times, and kind of like you said, you were a very big part of that. Those like first seventeen years, you know, of my life. I remember, I still remember your bar mitzvah, and I yes. can still remember where it was, and I still remember, like I said, playing Batman and Robin in your basement. Yes. You know, you had like a hiding space underneath your stairwell. Mm -hmm. You know, and I remember some other things that we did that we definitely can't talk about, uh, you know, with some with some other people in the neighborhood. So but uh, right. yeah, yeah, we, had, we definitely we had some strange we like it was you and I were sort of a constant, but there were other characters around who lived by us on Wood Avenue. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I'm curious. Are you like give any idea what became of some of our neighbors and everything, you know? Neighbors, not so much, because my parents weren't friendly with a lot of the neighbors. Right. Uh, but in terms of friends, you know, Facebook's been really good in terms of keeping in touch with people. Uh, right. It's funny. I, I always post links to these podcasts. I'm actually really looking forward to posting this link, you know, when it comes out next week, because I think people are going to be like, wow, it's me and you talking. Right. But like I posted one last week of I did one with an author and I'm not a big reader, but apparently a very pr pronounced uh, Katie Camillo. She's a child of uh, children's author. Right. And so many high school people that are into literature or teachers right now actually responded. People I hadn't talked to in 25 years saying, uh -huh. oh, my God, I can't believe you talked to Kate. Can't wait to listen. And I actually had some chats with some people from high school that I hadn't talked to in so long just off of this. Yeah. So so Facebook's been a nice mechanism. And I do talk to, you know, some people, you know, uh, one friend from high school I went to college with, room with for four years. 
and you know we still talk quite frequently and some other people now and then so yeah it, it's been nice don't keep in touch with probably as many people as i like yeah i think like you never really had a desire to go back for a reunion mm-hmm. you know so i don't know if you've ever hit one of those i definitely have not i haven't i've you know i've struck like the the reunion committee is they're pretty uh i wouldn't say aggressive because i do appreciate them reaching out i yeah. i do love it uh but you know they and every time i'm like ah should i shouldn't i and then they post the photos from the events i'm like ah he was there it would have been great to see him you know great to see him yeah. so I, I i haven't participated but then afterwards i kind of feel a little pang of regret you know all right so we'll have to make a note mental note we'll have to touch base before the next one maybe we'll go together yes i, th- I think i need support i need like an emotional well, i definitely do because i look at these people and i recognize some but i don't recognize more than i recognize i'm like who yes so I've looked at these pictures like, who would I hang out with? Right. Because most of my friends that I keep in touch with don't go. Right. So you're right. You need you definitely need to walk in with someone. So if you don't talk to anyone else, you have someone. Yeah. We went to a, a high school where the each class had like over 400 kids. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of people who it's like that. I went to, I, you don't even know you went to high school with that person, right? That, that's the thing. I, I, even when I don't recognize the faces, though, when you see the names, like they're tagged, I don't even recognize right. the names. Okay. <laughs> so I'm like, right. this is bad. And we were probably in different classes than a lot of them. Like me and you were in a lot of different classes because, you know, I was, I was a good student, but then there was good. And then there was like you and, you know, and you were definitely in, in more of the, uh, the higher, the higher levels, which I guess takes me to, you know, after high school, you went to an Ivy league school, mm-hmm. uh, with such high expectations in life. And then something went wrong and you got yourself into film. So I guess, <laughs> right. so, so what went wrong, Dan? Uh, right. Well, I remember when I got into college, uh, one one comment that always sticks with me is your father. Mm-hmm. I got into Brown and uh, Joe Hoffman, your dad, says to me, you, you got into Brown. Is that a college or a color? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like his kind of joke. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> that that always stuck with me, though, because it, at, at least it's, it's very humbling. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and I never I still to this day don't have an answer to that question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> Right. Brown, so, you still know, brown is still brown. So there's nothing wrong with that. Yes, it is still brown. You know, I went to Brown and then I, you know, I I was always into writing. I was always mm-hmm. into like creative writing in like high school and that kind of thing. So one thing I was always interested in doing is being a film critic, mm-hmm. you know, writing about film. That was my thing. And then as I got to college, I started like, you know, taking more film classes and that kind of thing and realizing that maybe like a documentary was sort of good for me because it, that way I could be more involved in film. I could still use my writing skills and I could explore issues that I was interested in, you know? So that's how I kind of, after Brown, I kind of, uh, you know, started working for a company, a company in the city called Great Projects, which was doing a lot of like big PBS mm-hmm. projects. Yeah. And it was such a, it was a small production company that I was able to sort of go through the ranks pretty quickly. And I started producing and directing almost right away. Um. You know, and then sort of working on all kinds of big like documentary projects, you know. Uh, so I think, let's see, in about 2002, 2003, I left Great Projects and started my own company, which is Ironbound Films. And we continued doing the same kind of work. It was me yeah. and someone that I worked with at Great Projects, and we went on to found our own company. And obviously that's been successful because 20 years later and you're still and you're still going strong. Yes, yes. You know, the documentary film is is described as the world's most expensive hobby, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you are able to sort of do documentary work, which is your passion, and fill all the, you know, keep the lights on with like corporate work, marketing videos, public relations videos, mm-hmm. customer testimonials, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we also do a lot of animation. Uh, mm-hmm. and then you're able to to keep the doors open and, you know, keep like, you know, all the time it takes to raise grants for these documentary films, you're able to do that. Right. So, so that so that that leads to the the business side of this. So right. the documentaries, which is what you guys are in theory known for, at least externally, mm-hmm. is the passion side. And obviously, obviously, there's a money component to those. And you have to make sure you're not losing your shirts over it. But right. you supplement it with some of the I don't want to say less exciting things, but some of the smaller projects to kind of you know pay the bills. Yes. And you know what? You develop a passion for those things, too, because like like all art, a corporate project, it requires a certain a different part of your brain, a different skill Mm -hmm. set, you know, to make the client happy, to get their message across, to make it as like as high quality and get all the best. Like 
And to really, so many people approach us where they want to do a marketing or corporate video, make it look like a documentary that you'd see on Netflix. Right. You know, which sounds impossible because you're interviewing the IT guy who you can't understand, or yeah. you're trying to jam in messaging that nobody would be interested in other than people from the company, you know? Sure. But that has become a that has become our specialty too, to try to pull that off and make the client happy and make it make these videos as accessible to as large an audience as possible, you know. So, so with the documentaries, and you've done some interesting ones, and you know, like uh, the Morton Downey one, I, I've seen, you know, I've seen several clips of that over the years. You know, when I when, when your name pops up, I, you know, I always like Google you and see what's going on. And then obviously the Israeli baseball team one is, is totally fascinating to me. How do these projects come about? Meaning. Do they come to you? Do you seek out something and say, hmm, this might be a story that I'd want to see? Like, what's the process of the idea into the product? Uh, okay. Well, there's there's a few different ways that we that we come upon these things. One, it's a passion project, right? Mm -hmm. Where, let's say, it, growing up uh, in New Jersey, Morton Downey shot his show in Secaucus. Mm -hmm. I was into the, the sort of dynamic of the, the political discussion on Morton Downey. And so were my two partners at Ironbound. Mm -hmm. So we decided let's put all our, you know, our our efforts into trying to make this film happen. Let's mm -hmm. try to raise money for it, that kind of thing. So there's the, the internal ideas. Mm -hmm. Then there's uh, there's the kind of idea that we imagine could be marketable. Uh, and that doesn't mean marketable in the traditional commercial sense necessarily, but it could also mean marketable. Let's say we want to do a documentary. There's not a documentary out there about... Uh, about linguistics or about mm -hmm. anthropology that is mm -hmm. sort of, so we do a, a documentary that we know we could raise money for from say the National Science Foundation or mm -hmm. a var variety of other uh, entities that support documentaries. Uh, there's that. Then there's people who come to us with ideas. And nor usually the people who come to us with ideas either have one of two things. One, money. Someone who comes to us with a million dollars will do a documentary on their, you know, on their aunt. You know, it doesn't, yeah. right. And how slowly your grass is growing. Million dollars, we can make that work. Right, exactly. We will make the, the, the most brilliant documentary on, on lawn, on your lawn. <laughs> uh, but, you know, more often, uh, the person not necessarily has money, they have access. Mm -hmm. So what that means is uh, here is this footage that no one else has seen, or here is access to a team uh, that no one else has access to. For example, mm -hmm. you, you bring up the Israel baseball. We had access to Israel, uh, the Israeli baseball teams uh, run at the World Baseball Classic. Mm -hmm. The World Baseball Classic is essentially the World Cup for Major League Baseball, yeah. right? A bunch of like international teams compete. And in 2017, Israel had a Cinderella run. Mm -hmm. They kind of, a bunch of Jews, no one thought they'd be any good. They're playing all these Latin teams, you know, who are like Cuba and the Dominican yeah. Republic. And they go on this incredible run. And we were there. Uh, and it's okay and for you to say a bunch of Jews like that because there's a two two Jews here having this conversation. So we're not offending yes. anyone. So, <laughs> And I say that only because I, I know how you play basketball, Mike, and, you know, you know how I play. So. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and I enough. played a ton of baseball too, right? That was oh, yeah, right on the side basketball. of my house with, with a tennis ball, yep. Yep, right. Um, uh, and football too, right? We, there was a bunch of football as well. That was painful. Yes. Like literally, literally painful. I'm just thinking back to how bad we were painful. Right. Although, Mike, here's a, 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 a history question for you. I remember we used to play basketball, but then you had that court built, right? Mm -hmm. Like, when was that? Was that in high school that you had that done? Yeah, my dad took a big uh, a backyard, an empty area, and just basically put a nice size slab of cement against the house. Right. And put, put a hoop up. That probably was, I would say, not high school, but definitely before high school. I oh, would wow. say probably third or fourth grade for me. So, you know, how old oh, is that? So Eight or nine? Really that happened. Yeah. It, yeah. I don't think when we started playing basketball, I don't think you were really into the sports as much. So no. I don't think we played early on. You really played. I don't think you started probably playing ball with us probably more till high school. Yes. I, right. The one thing yeah. I remember about you, and I don't know if it's still the case, you're older, so probably not. Uh -huh. You were like the fastest person I know speed wise. <laughs> like I remember you could run like you could run and I never could. People said my ears would always hold me back. Right. But <laughs> I remember you were fast. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm not fast anymore. Yeah. You know, that, that you should also know. Um, yeah. I guess. Yeah. The, but, the listeners yeah, want to know you're not fast anymore. Got it. No, but uh, yeah. you know, I have two kids who are athletic shockingly. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I want to talk about that because I know your one son. Yeah, I, I know is uh, wrestling at the D at the college level. Yes, he's wrestling at Columbia. That's fantastic. Yeah, um, and my younger son plays lacrosse, uh, which is big around here. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I did like my one sort of uh, sport that I did, which was just a season. I did high hurdles at, at J.P. Stevens on the track team. Okay, so I don't even remember that. Okay. Yeah, it didn't last. So that's probably you, you probably didn't know the the few weeks that I was doing it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny, um, but yeah. So, but yeah, your your point to Jewish Jewish people playing baseball oh, and right. beating Latin right. teams is probably a pretty surprising. All right. So, result. so the, the Israel baseball team they had this Cinderella run, and we were there. Mm -hmm. We were there getting exclusive access to this incredible story, and the team like you know it, it kind of rallied the whole Jewish community around this like sort of obscure event, you know, the World Baseball Classic, and it ended up being this national story that we had exclusive access to. Anyway, as a result. The film did extremely well, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, every sort of we, the Jewish film festival circuit, which exists. I'm not sure you knew this, but it's a I very strong. A lot of like the 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 audiences for these films, people who still go to theaters are generally like retirees. And, you know, it's a lot of that's why the Jewish film festival thing works. You get it. You show your your film to a, a, a theater that's filled with people and cheering and enjoying, you know, this content. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. It was a big hit. And then as a result of that, we did a second movie. This time we followed this, this, a lot of the same Jewish baseball players to the 2021 Tokyo Olympics, mm -hmm. um, which they didn't do as well at. Mm -hmm. But the thing there was that they went to the Olympic Village in Tokyo, you know, and they experienced a lot of anti-Semitism. So you imagine the Olympic Village as this place where all these nations come together and there's peace yeah. and harmony. and here there's, there's these Israeli players who, you know, experience this, have a completely different experience of the Olympics. And well, you our should, cameras were there. Well, you would think it would be a secure and safe place, meaning right, exactly. Olympic Village. So a lot of these players are like American players who have, you know, Jewish heritage. Uh, like a lot of Olympians uh, tend to, you know, they, they're they just a citizen of that country so they could compete in the Olympics, you know. Sure. That's the same as the, same as the case of Israel. Yeah. So they are experienced what it's like to represent Israel on the world stage for the first time, you know, yeah. and they experience all the every all the good that comes with it and all the bad that comes with it. So that's also like a very interesting story. That film is called. And Israel so relevant Swing. with what's going on in the world right now, too. Yes. Yeah. That film, it's called Israel Swings for Gold. It'll be in theaters in February. So but it's also, you know, again, it's doing it's doing a lot of bookings now at synagogues and festivals and stuff. People are interested in seeing a story about Israel that's not political. They want to of feel course. good about Israel. They want, mm -hmm. like, you know, and they, uh, so it's, as much as it's not escape, it is escape to some degree. They want to feel good about Israel, you know, so it's it's a, it's doing well. That's ex that's exciting. That's something I definitely look forward to watching because, like I said, as a sports fan, mm -hmm. I enjoy generally any sports documentary anyway. You like the underdog story, especially in your first one where they did go further than they're supposed to go, which adds yeah. an extra level. So you kind of got lucky there in, in a sense. Yeah, you're covering a team who could have been, you know, knocked out in week one and they kind of yeah. went on like this wild ride. Yeah, they say, right, their performance saved the movie in a sense, you know. Of course. The movie yeah. isn't as good. You know, the Kurt Warner story that came out last year, you know, if he doesn't, if his team goes six and 10 and doesn't make the playoffs, there's probably not a Kurt Warner story. Right, 100%. So it's like, yeah. You rely on, you know, there's so many things that hit the cutting room floor, so many projects that are shelved or don't make it because the person you're following doesn't deliver anything, mm -hmm. you know, and in this case, it, they did. So that that's that was a big part of the, the success of the film. Is there, I guess, making a, what I'll call a creative film versus a documentary? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm going to state the obvious here, but I'm going to ask in the form of a question. Yeah. I imagine it's a totally different approach because... I'm sure you can do creative liberties in terms of telling the story, mm -hmm. but it's obviously super important if it's a true documentary that any liberties you're taking do not at all change the story. And yeah. you hear about a lot of these movies and you know, the one that's been in the news lately is the blind side, you know, uh -huh. when the, with, with the issues with all like the, you know, the royalties and stuff like that, but that's a, based on the story of, but then when you talk to this, oh, this scene never even happened. This scene never even happened. And it basically you have a basic storyline that is here 
and it went all the way to these things to make it more entertaining to get to how the story ends. Yes. But your documentary, here's the story, and you kind of have to kind of stay on that line, either exactly on the line or only kind of, you know, stray off it a little bit. Did right. I say? Uh, well, yes and no. That is okay. like sort of the, like, Imagine, okay, so here I am. I'm the director of a documentary film, and most of the audience thinks that however I portray it is the way it happened, much like mm-hmm. you're describing. But still, I have tremendous liberties to portray, to not show some things. Yes. To, to show some things, to ask questions in a certain way, to only show, to point my camera only at certain things, right? So I am shaping a story in a way That's that true. let's say, uh, I would say even that a news report doesn't do, but often news is the same way. They are it is so interpretive by the people who are behind the camera, you know. Uh, but also with documentary, I have let's say an hour and a half of running time, and I have to hold your attention with not just reality, right? Mm-hmm. I have to make the story so compelling and provide some some like visual cues and artistry mm-hmm. that keeps you in. So in order to do that. There's a, a, a tremendous amount of manipulation that goes on in the edit room, in production. Uh, you know, one story, even the story of the Israel baseball team could be told like a thousand different ways. Right. You know. Um, and I'm sure you can make a team member the hero. And I'm sure you can make someone the enemy very quickly by taking actual footage. And either cutting a quote halfway through or not showing you said something or showing a confrontation and just showing the first half, but not the end where the guy apologizes or something like that. Yes, exactly. I mean, but to your point, Mike, it's like you go, you screen a movie, uh, a documentary, and if it doesn't touch on the way that someone remembers it, you know, about a certain event, let's say about Israel baseball, well, why didn't you show Israel's reaction when this happened? Because that's Mm -hmm. how I remember it. And so you also have to deal with how, how the world experienced the event. Mm-hmm. And you have to somehow be true to that too, right? So there's there's a manipulation that I could do to a degree, but it it's not it's not a hundred it's not completely expansive. You know, I can't I can't really create this reality. I'm only shaping it. Right, but do you do you have in your mind how you want this to end? Meaning, you know, Joe Shimo me who's gonna watch it at the end. Right. Do, are you thinking to yourself, this is and we all interpret things differently, but this is kind of what I want Joe Schmo to think about and have a f- think about the situation when it's done. Or do you kind of say, well, it doesn't matter. I'm putting this together. However he thinks about it's fine. Or do you know, oh, okay, I want with the Israeli baseball team. I want the message to be underdogs, exceeded expectations, great group of guys. And I need to make sure Joe Schmo thinks that when it's done. The great question, Mike, you're asking questions that like, speak directly to like the the theory behind filmmaking you know i mean it's like the bad filmmaker will go in with preconceived notions about how mm-hmm. he wants the story to unfold you have to as a, especially as a documentary filmmaker you got to go out there with maybe some ideas because you're a human being about what it is and then mm-hmm. let and the, the events that transpire the personalities that intercede the the intersections of 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 people that you witness that dictates the story, not you. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, I don't I don't make films that are like political polemics or come in with like these ideas of how I want people to think. I mean, I do want people to get along and I want people to be happy and I'm interested in human achievement and I'm interested in creating role models for people. Basic, yeah. that kind of stuff. But one thing all my films include is the failures of the protagonists. Mm-hmm. Uh, their preconceived notions, let's say you have a scientist who visits some native community seeking to record some part of their knowledge or language, and they have missteps. Uh, or the baseball team goes out there and their strategy is all wrong. They're too too much hubris hmm. when they go out there. You know, those failures ultimately make better heroes. And that's so- how- Oh, yeah. So even I'm, you know, I'm interested in portraying the full story as much as I can, Mm -hmm. as much as I like worship, you know, our subjects sometimes, you know, or have like high expectations for them. I think it's important to see everything. Uh, Well, and and from a viewer's perspective, if this person comes in and just does everything right, that's boring. Yes, it's 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 boring. Right. Um, And it doesn't it doesn't. Viewers are so cynical that they see someone who does everything right and they think. What are we not seeing? Yeah. You know, 
they've been so trained to know that they're not getting the full story. So you right, want to you want to make people know that they are or, or give them as much of, of, of that as, the, as you can. Now, so you have partners. Are you guys working on the projects together or are you directing this project? You know, they're working on something else, meaning I imagine someone's got to ultimately have the say on how, as you said, how it gets cut and portrayed. Yes. No, we all work on almost everything, almost everything together. The smaller projects, we kind of split up. For mm -hmm. example, we are right now, the project we have in production is on uh, anti-Semitism on college campuses. Can anything be more mm -hmm. relevant now? Um, that, that, that's a perfect situation. Like I said before, you kind of, I hate to use the word lucky because that's an yes. awful thing to say what's going on in the world. But in terms of luck, in terms of the how that just became so relevant in the past month and a half. Yeah. No, it's well, uncanny. Yes, it, it's well, OK, so we were somebody approached us to do a documentary on college anti-Semitism. They had some funding a year ago. This is, you know, uh, at least uh, maybe even longer than a year. This is before mm -hmm. the events in Israel. Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th uh, and before everything exploded on college campuses everywhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we have been at these college campuses across the country you know, Tulane, Berkeley, GW, all over the place, following these students' stories about how they're dealing with smaller instances of anti-Semitism, you know, microaggressions, a professor says the wrong thing, or someone attacks a Hillel or some, you know, whatever it is, and how they deal with it, how they, you know, either bring up a, a legal case or how they sort of find support from other students, how it's an ongoing problem at college campuses. Mm -hmm. Then this thing happens, this world event, and suddenly there's anti-Semitism everywhere, you know? Yeah. So as with every story, when you're in on the front lines of, it's good and bad, right? We have the access that no one else has. We've been following these students from the get-go. We have all these relationships in place. We have footage before they ex this exploded and after. Mm -hmm. Bad news is now it's a national news story. CNN every night is covering anti-Semitism on yeah. college campuses. In a very like kind of superficial way, you know, that's news uh, and people want the more in-depth thing, but it's a, it's a balance. You know, you want you want the story that people won't be sick of. Right. Sure. You know. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I didn't think of it that way. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I could tell you, you know, I'm sure with your with your son at Columbia, and my daughter is at Penn State right now. Yeah. The, it, that dynamic has changed dramatically. And she's only a freshman. Mm -hmm. Just like I think your son's a freshman, right? He's a sophomore. Oh, sophomore. Okay. So I could tell you from her, who's been there only three months, what she experiences now versus what she experienced pre October 7th right. is dramatically different. Right. You, so you're, both your daughters are at Penn State, Mike? No, my oldest one is in grad school at TCNJ. Oh, okay. And where my did youngest is a freshman at Penn State. So where did she go under, go undergrad? Your TCNJ. Oldest? She's in a fifth oh, okay. year of a five year program. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, you know, one one remarkable thing, Mike, was when your youngest got into Penn State, I've never seen like such a display of candy, balloons, oh. you know, on her. You guys really, it was. I want to be clear. Yeah. That's not us. I, you, I don't know if you remember me. I'm just in, in this regard. I am so not a showy. It's just not me, but that's what happens now. And it happens you know, a lot, it happens with the Long Island kids and it happens, I don't know if it happens in your area, but yeah. they have these bed decorating for all the, for all the girls. That's just the reality yeah. of it. And what happens is you surprise the kid, the uh -huh. friends plan it, the friends basically register where uh -huh. the best friend who handles it, the best friend who handles it is a, basically says, all right, these are the 80 things she wants from Penn State. And, and you know, Jamie says, I'll I'll order her the slippers. I'll order her the hat. I'll order her this sweatshirt. I'll get this sweatshirt. Right. And they all come together. They sneak into the house. We then will obviously get the food and that kind of stuff. And you kind of go crazy. And maybe right. uh, maybe if my uh, marketing person is really good for the YouTube version of this podcast, we'll put a picture up of the room. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but, it, but, but, it, but it's crazy. So, yes. you know, when she left for college, half the stuff she got, she couldn't even bring because you're in a, you know, you're in a jail cell dorm room. Right. And she would use her entire closet for Penn State hoodies, Penn State sweatpants, Penn State flip flops, Penn State sunglasses, seven different hats that say, you know, F you the other schools. And it says this and that. It, it, it's absolutely crazy. But you have to, it, it's what everyone does. Every girl does this. Yeah. 
yeah, I guess because with my when I saw those pictures, I almost felt like neglectful to the point of abusive of my own children. Well, you're a bad you know? father. How yes. How much attention was lavished? I was like, oh my I showed it to my wife. I was like, man, are we did, did should we call child services? You know? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's it, it's a I will say this, it's a girl thing. The right. boys don't have anything. Uh-huh. And I'll say this, it's not so bad for us. But a lot of in Long Island, they have two of them. When they right. first hit the button to accept, uh-huh. they have like family, like a whole big family thing, and they have all the decor. And uh-huh. they have all this stuff. And then they do this one with the with the friends. When Gabby hit the button to accept, right. all we did is my her best friend came over, my sister came over, and my mom came over. Right. And we literally it was nothing. We didn't and we I don't know, we brought in pizza or subs. It was, it was nothing. Right. But others, they have like a second decorating where they're now all downstairs is all in the balloons and stuff like that. They actually do two rounds of it. Wow. One round was enough. But it's amazing in an hour and a half when you have a lot of people what you could turn a room into. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I yeah. I guess Gabby, right? That's her name, Gabby? Yeah, Gabby, Gabby, yeah. Gabby. Okay, so Gabby, like she not only did she get this from her friends, but she probably took part in doing this for a lot of other friends, right? That's the point. Oh, it, it, it's like bar mitzvah season and bar mitzvah season all over again because it's every right. weekend you have one. Some days you go one to another. Uh-huh. Some are on a Wednesday night at 9 o'clock. Oh, yeah, so the amount of money we're spending – on uh-huh. gifts for everyone else. So while she got it, that's great. All this free stuff. Right. It's not free because I'm buying this person for this school, this person for this school. And like I said, it, it's, oh yeah, it, it's nonstop. Right. 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 Well, yeah. it, so it, it's crazy. Enjoying, she's enjoying school. Enjoying school. Yep. Yeah. That's terrific. Yeah. You, you, all you, like you said, all you, all you want is for your kids to be happy and, you know, you know, kind of like happy wife, happy life. It's it's even more so for your kids, you know. Yes, exactly, exactly. Your, your no, kids are happy, some... you're happy, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. So what do your kids think, you know, of, of your movies? Are, are they, oh, I don't care what dad does, or are they like really, they talk to you through the process, or are they just excited to kind of see it when it comes out? Like, what's their role in this? Uh, you know, it's it's very interesting with kids. It's like uh, we did a, a, we did a documentary recently about a young punk band. Uh, and th- they were a punk band of eight uh, that consisted of their members were eight to 12 years old. Mm-hmm. And they were the youngest band to ever play uh, Warp Tour, which is like a big punk festival. You know, this okay. was right around COVID. You know, we, we did this film and it's it was a documentary meant for kids, uh, which it played a bunch of kids film festivals. The interesting thing about documentaries is it's like it's not necessarily a medium that is meant for gen z you know what i mean agreed you know um and i would i would extend not only to documentaries but my kids like i'm watching a movie remember how like when the tv was on in your house you were just like drawn to it like you know how much tv we watch my kids aren't even interested in the television and on television because they have this in their hand yeah they have the phone they have tiktok and they just like it's not even that they're always like watch i mean they are always watching videos but they do it on their own time in their own kind of mm-hmm. way you know um and the notion of sitting in a theater and and sitting through they like are happy to watch my films and like you know sort of respond to them in a way but it's not how they sort of uh internalize information yeah. you know it, um, it, it, it's very different now movies and stuff you know, I tried to get my kid to sit down. To me, there's like certain movies in every generation. I'm sure you'd appreciate this, that you want your kids from the movies from the previous generation. To me, there's a few movies that define our generation. Yeah. And I'm sure if you name some, we're going to kind of come up with some of the same ones. And like, I yeah. want them to sit and watch these. Why? Because I think they're entertaining, not because they're going to teach a life lesson, <laughs> but they were just almost like a very important part of my childhood. And I remember watching this movie 40 times. Yeah. You know, like a Ferris, and for us, like a Ferris Bueller's Day Off, like just yes. stupid movies. You're not learning from it. Yeah, I can't even get them. If I give a list, I think they're more adamant now not to watch it because I want them to watch it. Right, right. Ferris Bueller is a good one because the kids did like Ferris Bueller's. That one, yeah. yes. But if you take them to a more like, uh, let's say, more of a John Hughes movie, like Breakfast Club, or like sure. one of those, the entire John or Sixteen Candles, all those, yes. Those are a little more dated because they're not as they're they're sort of deal with these like emotional issues or mm-hmm. mental health things that, that yes. kids sort of relate to in a different way nowadays. So mm-hmm. everything is so kind of dated, you know. Um, oh, that it's I, I get clips on my phone when I go on clips, and for some reason I'm embarrassed to say this, 
you know, I get like clips for some reason, like old Beverly Hills 90210 clips just pop up on my Facebook feed. Don't know why. I'm not part of the fan club, I swear. But you you even watch that and how dated it is because yeah. they don't have cell phones. Right. So it's like they just come home like, oh, what do you mean they didn't call me? Do you sure? Did you check the right. answering machine? You know, and right off the bat, it loses all credibility with them because it's just so different. Or you'll see them go into the school lab trying to figure out how to get onto the computer. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. You know? One 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 sort of thing, one movie form that keeps up, I found, is the horror film. Like things that were scary to us. My kids will go to a sleepover and watch some of the same things. Not all of them. Yeah, but, but like, I don't know if you remember this. You were into something I wasn't into, and okay. one of them was horror movies. And if uh, I remember correctly, the other one was Monty Python. <laughs> I didn't realize. Really, that was a that was a point of contention. I didn't realize that it much. was you because you and some of the other guys we were friends with loved going to Monty Python. Right. Yes. And you couldn't pay me enough to go see that. Right. So, so you might want to show your kids Monty Python, but I personally never really got, and still to this day, like British humor, like it's not my thing. Right. 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 But, and I, horror I, I, films was never my thing too. Like I remember people watching horror movies. I'm like I'm not going. I didn't like right. it. I wanted no part of it. I was embarrassed because it would scare me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't care how much those things hold up over time. I'm still not watching them. Right. 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 Yeah, that makes sense. I I have like given up on making my. I don't do that. I, a lot of my friends are like you, showing them things that were meaningful to them. Yeah. You know. Uh, I, I don't do it for the point of a lesson. Uh -huh. I like it, and maybe it was more so even during COVID. We're all sitting in the house. Mm -hmm. Like, let's watch a movie night. When they were trapped with me, they weren't going to their friends' houses. They couldn't right. always be on the phone. I'm like, let's watch a movie. So we go to Netflix. We try and find something. Like, oh, let's watch this. I love this as a kid. Once I said that, that was not happening. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And even more yeah, recently, that's... I tried to get them to watch uh, one of my oldest one, Chelsea, to watch Forrest Gump. And I had a friend uh -huh. over. And right. I'm like, this is a cool movie because it's entertaining. It's fun. He's great in it. And it's mm -hmm. kind of like a little bit of a historical lesson in a fun way. Yes. It starts off a little slow. It does. Right. 15 minutes yeah. into like, we, we're done. It did well, not catch their interest in 15 minutes. They were done out the room. Forrest Gump is a great example. Like I could come home from work, you know, whatever. I get through dinner, you know, blah, blah, yep. blah, doing everything. Nine o'clock. I could sit through Forrest Gump for the 5,000th time and it'd still be entertaining. Yes. That being said, it's a movie in which Tom Hanks portrays like a, 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 a person who is developmentally disabled, right? Yeah. So you don't necessarily see that anymore. You know, to right. try to show that kind of movie to this generation is a bit of a head scratcher, right? There's Who two movies person? that come to mind like that. And one yeah. was from our generation growing up. Can you think of that one? And the guy won an award for it. Oh, you mean Rain Man? Is that Rain Man, yeah. Yeah. The entire theme of the movie was he's developmentally, you know, challenged. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, for that kind of, for that, and also, you know, there's this also recent controversy around Forrest Gump, too, where, like, they live, the place they live is like a famous plantation. I'm not sure you know this. No, I do not know. Like, yeah, in Mississippi. Or, I, I think, no, they were from Alabama, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah. The, the, the actual home is a famous slave owner's home. That oh, wow. sli it's never addressed in the film. They have a black servant in, in Forrest Gump, but they yeah. never quite overtly addressed, which is like, to you and me, that makes like, who cares, you know, right. but to like someone who's like watching for all those kind of cultural views is uh, it's not going to satisfy. And that kind of thing is avoided today. You know, uh, being in the film industry, can, yeah. are you have the ability to watch a regular film, not even a documentary? And are you able to watch it as a fan like I am? Or are you constantly analyzing whether it's camera angles, story twists, anything like that? Are you? Can you just watch it as a regular person like me? A regular film, yes. Like in a, by regular film, I mean like a narrative film, feature film, yeah. yes. Documentaries, no. Yeah. Documentaries, I'm always aware of what they're doing and why they're doing and, and how I would do things differently. And it's hard because like if I hate a documentary, it's like, wait, am I just, was I just jealous of what the success of this film? You know, there's yeah. always that like, am I just hating on it? You right. Know? No matter and what they did, it could have been the most perfect documentary ever. I'm going to find fault with it. Right. Exactly. There's yeah. that. There's like, oh, God, why? If I had the funding to do this, I would have done a better job. You know, there's that kind of thing. Also, another form of hating. I'm completely aware of, you know. Yeah. It, what it, I always find fascinating is these people who like look at these films mm -hmm. when they find errors. And right. the error could be the beginning of the scene. We're talking. They switch the camera away and they come back. And now suddenly I'm wearing a different shirt. Right. 
I, I love when those things are pointed out. My favorite one, because I'm a Penn State guy, is the movie Rudy. Uh huh. Now, this has been told to me, and I just actually, literally, I saw this scene last week. Mm-hmm. So it's true when when Ned Beatty's the dad's coming to Notre Dame for the first time to see the game that Rudy's suiting up for. I, I assume you've seen the movie. Yes, 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 yes. When he walks in the stadium, mm-hmm. and the band's on the field playing, and they're playing Georgia Tech in that game. Uh huh. The band is playing the Penn State fight song. <laughs> Mike, that is like something that maybe you and. I guess no. I, I won't say nobody else, but that is something that no. Because I heard it from someone else. I didn't pick up on it. Oh really? Oh no. This. Let's see if we Google this later. I'm sure you won't. But if you did yeah. Google it, I bet you you can find the scene. Because from what I gather, when I heard an interview with him a couple of years ago, so I'm, I might be saying this wrong. With Sean Aston, they uh-huh. basically had 15 minutes at halftime of two games uh-huh. to film the scenes because they needed a full stadium. Right. So oh, when the okay. teams went in. The rights this movie had like two weekends, and one was a Penn State game, even though they didn't play Penn State, but they had to find games where the weather was going to be similar. So they couldn't do a game in November where there was snow on the ground, and they couldn't do September right. when it was like sunny and 90 because they needed a crowd to all be in the same. So they had like a back to back weekends, and right. one was Penn State. So I think they filmed, and, and probably thinking Notre Dame is playing their own song, but I, a lot of times in college, you play the fight song of the visiting team as like a courtesy yeah. kind of, you know, the pregame show. And they actually played that. Right. That's, yeah. You know, it's funny because I was just commenting recently that like, you know, so often in these college, we, we watch a tremendous amount of football in this house because my, yeah, my oldest son sweet. played. And, yeah. So the, you, you just constantly hear the marching band playing the distorted, like, you know, just like you can't yeah. really distinguish between fight songs. It's just like a, right. and maybe that's what they thought at the time that like, who, who is going to notice who is going to be the, and here we right, are. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to, you're, when we're done, I'm going to get your cell phone number and I'm going to find that clip and I'm going to send it to you. <laughs> okay. And I'm you won't know if I'm lying or not because you don't know the Penn State fight song, but you have to trust me on this one. <laughs> but my, my point being, it's amazing to me that uh-huh. all the people for that kind of film that looked at that. Yes. That that made it through wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of times, I mean, the, the, one of the more famous now is that Game of Thrones. You remember that? series on hbo and i have to honest with you i was not a games of thrones person so i did i never saw it okay well in one of the scenes you know this was set in like you know a non-existent time of like mm-hmm. well that imitated the middle ages whatever and some yeah. some some te- some crew person left a starbucks coffee cup in one of the scenes right so you know they're talking about dragons and this and that and there's yeah. a starbucks like coffee cup sitting on like you know the, uh, some 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 That's stone funny. behind them uh, yeah, but you know it's amazing how many eyes these things pass. Yeah, still to this day, like you know, there's like a misspelling in a documentary or a fact mm-hmm. we got wrong, and how many advisors we had look at it. There's only so much you could do. It's only only humans are creating these things, you know. No, right, right, no, exactly, exactly. So yeah. I know you're working on an Israeli thing, and I'll get you off here soon. Uh, what's next for you guys? Uh, you're working on. You said the new Israeli film's coming out. You're working on the anti-semitism on the college campuses right anything else in the horizons or yeah well i don't want that you to we think can I speak only, about what i i don't want you to think i only do jewish films but somehow <laughs> it just lately what happened with that uh that first movie that about the israel baseball team the first movie was called heading home hmm? heading home the tale of team israel once we sort of did so well with that film these opportunities for other Jewish films have kept coming to us. You know sure. what I mean? And also, as I said before, it's like by most accounts, the independent film market is really dying. People are art house cinemas, as they're known, these small independent cinemas are closing everywhere. So the people who are still coming out to these theaters are these older Jewish people and they love seeing Jewish content. So that somehow I keep on getting these opportunities to do Jewish project. So. Well, listen, I'm looking at your bio of your company. I'm just going to say three words to you. Yes. Newberger, Kramer, Miller. It sounds like a law firm, right? <laughs> it sounds like a Jewish or, law firm. <laughs> or, or an accounting firm, Mike, right? It, it does, like, yeah. Right. right. It, it's the next like the next stop on your LinkedIn. It's like Mike Hoffman, partner at Kramer, Miller, and Newberger. That's there you go. Well, exactly. I, I, I hear, yes, we were all clearly of the tribe, so that makes it easy. But anyway, <laughs> the next film is 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 the weirdest of, of anything I've done. It's how when we settle Mars, 
what what will become of the Jewish people? In other words, yeah, it's it's that weird. Okay, so for example, how will, when we need to, there's a bunch of different Judaism is like an earthbound religion. We pray facing Jerusalem, right? We so much of the the whole Jewish calendar is based on the moon's uh, mm -hmm. revolution around the earth, right? Uh, and how will that change when we are, you know, the notion of settling other planets with Elon Musk and with, you know, mm -hmm. SpaceX and all these other sort of private ventures has become a reality. How will Judaism change once we are in a different place? How will we be able to if, keep culture? If, sure? if you change? gave 100 people the first line of that sentence and said, fill in the blank. And if the first line was, when we settle on Mars, comma, <laughs> You would have gotten 500 answers, I think, before anyone would have said, hmm, what's the impact on the Jewish community? Right. Yes. No. But Jew old Jewish How will we eat? How will we travel? You know, all, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> right. No, you know, but, I don't care about that. I don't care about any of the technical stuff. It's just what will happen yeah. to Judaism. That's um, pretty funny. Yeah. But, you know, it's it because it's a new way, just like all these films, just like the baseball mm -hmm. and college campuses and Mars. It's just a new way of looking at faith and a new way of looking at like mm -hmm. either religion, not not just Jewish religion, but a new way for everyone to think about, well, where where do I come from and how how am I? What is my part in the continuum of that? And what is the mm -hmm. future of it? And what does it mean to yeah. me? And all these are just different you know, examinations of that. That is as a filmmaker. That's all you're doing is. Here we are. We're all humans. We're sort of here's another reexamination of the human condition and what it means to us in the past, present, and future. You know, this well, Mars one. It, I it's can like tell you the reason up. you're so good at it is I could just you, when you talk about your project, you can you can hear the passion. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like it's it's because it's my uh, it's it's what I'm always kind of searching for in these mm -hmm. topics. You know what I mean, Mike? It's like uh, something that if it doesn't interest you. It will interest no one. You will not be if you're not passionate about it. You won't be able to. to people won't be interested in seeing it. So because it, it takes over your life. I mean, this yes. becomes besides your family. This becomes your project for whether it's three months, six months, nine months. In your case, it's probably a year and a half, two years. You gotta probably feel passionate about it, or it's just gonna be selfishly. Forget the project itself. Selfishly, it's gonna be a miserable two years for you. Yes. Well, the, I've discovered one bigger project than like these films is getting your kid into college. That is like requires a tremendous amount of time, effort, and like and decorating like, the room. What's that? And decorating the room. Don't yes, forget that. Well, that. No, yeah, right. I, I thought I was doing enough. I <laughs> and you, right? <laughs> appreciate that. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I, I I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, you know, and, and it's funny, I, I've known you've done this. I've, I, I've followed you, you know, peripherally, you know, through the years, we, we obviously don't talk that much anymore, unfortunately. And you commented on one of my previous podcasts. And I think I had an, an I think I had a director who worked on projects, I think for the African community, African American community. And you kind of said interesting or whatever. And once you said that back, I'm like, damn, why am I not asking him to be on this? Because I know you've done these great projects and so forth. So I'm right. I'm really glad we made the connection. I really appreciate the time. And, uh, you know, I have to give this right now because of the things we've discussed. The opinions expressed on this podcast are those of simply our guest and myself and are not those of the firm. I don't say that every time, Dan, but because we've gotten into some other <laughs> religious topics, right. I felt the need to say it this time. <laughs> good, good. All right. Well, yes, I, you know, it's great to talk to you, Mike. You know, uh, I guess we think of each other in, in a different way, right? As like little kids, you know, me running yeah, from yeah. 18 to, to 6 Livingston in like... Yeah, there's a comfort level. Even, like you, you'd call me to hang out, right? I'd be like, okay, mm -hmm. Mike, I'll be there. In a, and then I'd run there just to say like that I would show instantly at your house. I could freak you out you right know? now. I know how many times I called you. I think I know your phone number from back there. That that wouldn't be surprising. Some of those things stick with you, but go ahead, give it a shot. Does your do, 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 does your dad still live there? Yes. Don't say the phone number. Good call. That's why I'm not saying the phone number. Okay. That's why I was asking because, but right, right. I, I am pretty sure I still know your phone number. Yeah. Right. I still have like scars on my person that I got at your house. You know what I mean? <laughs> we, <laughs> there's still you, there's like living tattoos on me that say Mike Hoffman. Essentially, I don't mean to like.
sort of freak you out or creep out your audience. Or and the other memory, I'll say this, it literally just popped in my head now, is you had, and this is something that our kids will not know about living in this generation. Mm -hmm. You had the coolest treehouse. Yes. We did have a tree. <laughs> and it was pretty high up. I remember climbing up a significant amount of stairs. I think your dad built it for you. Yes. You know, that was the difference between your dad and my dad. My dad would have had to hire someone to do that. Uh, but your dad was handy enough. And I do remember spending a lot of time in that tree house. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, you know, a lot of time, but it, it did go, go out of vogue. Event. As we grew older, it became less less of a priority to be up there, right? That's right. That's yeah, yeah. absolutely right. But listen, yeah, you know, it, it was so great talking to you. I wish you nothing but success with these upcoming projects. And, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, we can talk more often than we have in the past. Yeah, the next time, let's get together socially, Mike. Let's get the families together. It, it, it'll be a lot of fun. Would love it. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening to Adeptus On Air. If you like this episode, please subscribe and leave a review. If you have a question related to this episode or have a request for what you would like to hear, please email us at marketing at adeptuscpas.com. You can also find us at adeptuscpas.com online or follow us at Adeptus on social media. The views and opinions by the podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Adeptus. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice.